What, what do you do for a living? I invoke my right under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution and decline to answer the question. Former Kansas City Police Department intelligence detective and now attorney Gary Jenkins produced four documentary films, most recently Gangland Wire, creator of smartphone app entitled Kansas City Mob Tours. Download it now. If you like what you hear, go to ganglandwire.com. Navigate to the shop page. We need you to put a hit out on our donate button. Gangland Wire True Crime Stories is produced at the Big Dumb Fun Show Studio 4. And now, here's Gary Jenkins. Well, good evening, folks. Welcome to the beautiful Ice House in Midtown Kansas City, the studios of the Big Dumb Fun Show. I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Aaron. Say hello, Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Well, folks, tonight we, we have a, a special guest, you know, uh, part of our, um, our what do you call that, Aaron, our tagline? Our, our moniker. Our moniker, our, our, it's from the mouths of the men who did it. And, and sometimes we've got policemen and sometimes we've got guys from the other side. Well, we've got a, a real deal guy from the other side. It's our good friend, uh, Frank Culotta. You may, uh, if you watch my Facebook page, Gangland Wire, you'll see that every once in a while I'll repost something where Frank has taken somebody on a Las Vegas mob tour. He runs Las Vegas uh, tours and at mob locations in, in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you're ever out there, uh, you might get hold of me or, or when you get out there, I think that he said through TripAdvisor, you'll find the mob tour and, and you'll be able to, you'll be taken on a real mob tour of a guy who was right there when, when the actual events of casino were unfolding uh, in real life with Lefty Rosenthal and Tony Spilatro, well, Frank Collado was right in the middle of it. So we've got him on the line. It's uh, it's good to be here. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Folks, uh, Frank, has he's written, there's been several books out there about him that he has written uh, with, uh, with his friend Denny Griffin, who's a good friend of mine. It's kind of how I first met Frank was through Denny. Uh, and you have a book that that was just released. What kind of what's the uh, what's the general topic of this book, Frank? And what's the name of it? The the name of the book is the rise and fall of a casino mobster. Then the subtitle is the Tony Spilacho story through a hitman's eyes. And uh, it's all about Tony Spilacho. Of course, I have to be in it as a character because I lived the life with him. Yeah, you you work you work directly under Tony out there in, in Las Vegas for several years. Matter of fact, I think you've known Tony since you were a, a, a kid. Is that correct? I know Tony since we were about twelve years old. We grew up together. At the end of '78, I moved out to Las Vegas, and on his request uh, to be uh, to watch his back, you know, to be his uh, underboss, more or less. That's the term they use, the underboss. So that's what I was noted for, the underboss and the leader of the hole-in-the-wall gang. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we're going to talk about the, the, the birth of this caper because I've got, I've got a little input. I want to do a little compare and contrast uh, uh, of the that last night yeah. uh, at Bertha's because uh, I've been on the other side of one of those kinds of deals that uh, uh, <laughs> will be interesting for us to compare and contrast. Now, now this book, uh, what, what, what would be, what's a little bit different? There's been a lot of things written in, uh, about Tony Splatter, a lot of blog pieces and and been a couple of other books, I believe. Uh, what what will be different about this one, Frank? What would, what would be different about this book is uh, there's only one other person in this world that knew Tony's uh, darkest secrets other than me, and he is dead. His name was Joey Hanson. That was Tony's uh, best friend he grew up with, let's say. So uh, the story is... Uh, Everything that I knew about Tony, the good and the bad, everything, good and bad, you know. I didn't mix any words, and I talked about crimes that he committed that people uh, wondered who committed them. These are crimes that he told me that he'd done. Uh, so there, are, everything's exposed in the book. It's, it's pretty much out there, pretty good. It's, everything is fruitful. 
So when uh, he had moved out to Las Vegas uh, before you came out to Las Vegas, uh, from what I hear you saying, and he got out there and he started. Yes. He started like a, a you know, he, he was brought out, is, is my understanding, that IUPA sent him out to kind of watch Lefty Rosenthal and, and if Lefty needed any kind of muscle or any kind of uh, help that a guy like Tony Splatro could would could provide uh, in his running the casino, running the Stardust, and, and making sure the skin was running, then Tony was sent out for that by IUPA. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, he was out there to make sure, uh, my, more or less to protect le- uh, Lefty. And to, uh, Lefty was sort of a flamboyant guy and sort of like to keep him in check. But uh, Lefty was such a loose cannon and he loved notoriety so much that uh, Tony had to stay away from him. So Tony assigned another guy to hang around with him. And the guy was from New York. And uh, that sort of kept uh, the heat off of Chicago by putting somebody else from another city to hang around with him. And he would report back to Tony. Now, my job was to uh, go in that casino under Tony's orders and make sure that if there was any stealing going on, to get the guys that were stealing, like chip hustlers and all of that stuff, cheating at card games, was to uh, run them out of town. Or to get people uh, jobs in the in the casinos, one of the four casinos that Chicago operated, controlled, and uh, get get them food, room, camps, all that stuff, shows, and uh, that's basically my function was at the time I was out there. So, so you were the guy. Like I can remember. Um... There, uh, Kansas City policeman in Kansas City. They we had a connection at, at one of the casinos. He was a, a a guy who's who had a relative that's on the PD, and and we just call that guy up, call Sammy up, and and say, hey, we we need some uh, show tickets and and some other things out there in Las Vegas, and he'd call his his uh, uh, cousin out in Las Vegas, and then we'd go. St- Stop by. The, I think he. I can't remember. I think he worked at the Trop actually, and we'd stop by and see him, and he'd give us show tickets or, or, or maybe uh, comp us some uh, some meals and everything. So you were you were that guy that if Iupa or somebody in Chicago wanted to take care of somebody, they got a hold of you, and 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 you made sure they were taken care of. Yeah. Then I would go right to the casino manager and tell him what I needed, and then I was out of the picture, and that's all I had to do was check in once their name was registered. Uh, they would get everything that they needed in the in the casino. And most of these people that we vouch for, I vouch for, uh, were high rollers. So the casino gladly took care of them anyway. You know. Yeah. It was a very, uh, you know, you know. I knew you're going to get around to the skim. And my job wasn't to uh, watch the skim or even have know what it was about. And the funny thing is about it is that. One day I was standing by the count room, the cage, and I seen this little old guy picking up the boxes and back all the tables and bringing them into the count room, and the guard was standing on the outside. He wasn't allowed in there. And then the guy come out, he spotted me. And he said, hey, Frankie, how you doing? And I said, good. I said, well, when did you get a job? Or, you know, he was connected. He was married to somebody that was a boss in the Chicago office, and he says, oh, I've been there for about a couple of years, you know. He says, I'm the only one that could go in the count room, not even the hack, I meaning the cop. So I told him, listen, do me a favor, you know. I said, don't tell anybody you told me that, all right? <laughs> and I won't tell nobody you told me that, I said, because we'll both be in fucking trouble. I said, so keep that under your head. I said, well, I know you're part. I said, no, but I don't want to know that stuff, you know what I mean, because not. Now, I know something that I didn't want to know, all right? But I knew the skim was going on. I just didn't know who was the guy that was uh, able to go in that room, you know. Well, if you were... I found out. If they wanted you to know, they would have told you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now for everybody... uh, Frank, for everybody who listens to our podcast, not everybody is familiar as yourself and uh, Gary Jenkins are with the skim and the casinos. Can you tell us which four casinos were controlled by Chicago? Sure. The Stardust, that was the main one. Then we had the Fremont, which was downtown. 
We had the marina. That's where the MGM sits now. And then the Hacienda, where the elixir is now. Them are the casinos that uh, we basically, you know, were owned by Argent Corporation, which was uh, put in there by the outfit, you know, mm-hmm. created by the Chicago outfit. And uh, them were the casinos. We could do anything we wanted and, you know, like, like I said, shows and, you know, uh, getting people jobs in them casinos. But, you know, we just didn't put anybody to work in the casinos. We put, like, People that were related to people. Everything was favors, favors, favors. You know what I mean? One favor, you get another favor. You know what I mean? That's what it was all about. The cash rolled through the skim. I didn't get none of that. Wish I did. But I, I, I know how it was going after a while, you know, how it was leaving there. And the non be knowing to uh, me at the very end there that uh, Lefty was an informant. I don't, I'm sure you know that. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah, that was like, uh, you know, you guys ain't supposed to talk about it, you know. Right, you know, that's warrant the secrecy. That that's an <laughs> interesting thing. The I I ask a, a couple of your guys out there, uh, 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 Emmett, Emmett Michaels in particular, and, and he he refused to answer. Uh, and and uh, so I asked an FBI agent back here. I know back here in Kansas City about it, Bill Owsley, who was the he was the case agent. Over the uh, the whole uh, investigation here in Kansas City, and he refused to to answer me. And about oh, it wasn't shortly after that I stumbled across on the internet where Jane Ann Morrison out there at the the Las Vegas Review Journal printed an article. I th- I think she never liked Lefty Rosenthal, and she wanted to burn him. And and she printed it in the in the paper that he had been a top echelon informant and. Uh, according to high-level FBI sources, <laughs> so I went back to my friend uh, Bill and and I told him about that, and and he gave me a look of disgust, like I can't believe anybody admitted that outside the bureau. There, you know, and and I understand why, because if you run around running your mouth, you know, the next person coming in, you know, they're they're not going to want to. Uh, nobody's going to want to talk if you run, go around running your mouth. That just shows exactly. how tight they were. Exactly. You, you got to admire that. I, I yeah, but it wouldn't that. be too hard to figure out. It wouldn't take a genius to figure it out. I mean, <laughs> come on, everybody got indicted except him. Yes. Come on. <laughs> and, 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 and he was right in the center. He was like the linchpin of the whole thing, and everybody gets indicted but him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. You know, so I mean, I I I figured that out really quick, but I never I couldn't say that he was a rat, you know, yeah. an informant. But then as time goes on, I managed to get it out of somebody, you know. Yeah. And it made a whole lot of sense, you know, especially why they tried to kill him. That was Kansas City. Yeah. You know, to rig this car up. Yeah, I I th- so, you know uh, that's yeah, my theory. And you know, when we did the movie Casino. You know, he got he got a ton of money. You know, because it was about him, right? The movie. It, yeah, I know. And it he was. never once showed up on the set. Never once. I was there every day. Yeah. You know what? He what, was what, scared. You know. I don't blame him. He stayed out of Las Vegas after that. He stayed down there in Florida, and he, where he felt safe and probably had a, a walled-in kind right. of. Uh, a compound house or a, at least a, you know, a, a gated community they lived in and probably maintained a low profile. You'd have to yeah. c- have an awfully low profile to get away if they knew you were an informant. I mean, we're talking with Frank Culotta here, and uh, I'm looking here. At the, there's a Wikipedia page about you, Frank. You probably know that. Um, but here, yeah. there's a great story on there where it talks about you and Tony Spilatro uh, it says being on bad terms, and Tony became mistrustful. And on occasion, uh, Tony made you and some other people enter a jacuzzi wearing just like a bathing suit because he thought you had a wire on you. Right. He had everybody the same thing that was in the jacuzzi. Joe Blasco, the former Metro cop, even his brother Johnny Splacho. And Tony and I, you know, and they they furnished us with the, with the with the bathing suits. And I said, <laughs> "Wow, this guy thinks I'm I'm a rat." And at the time, I had no intentions of uh, becoming uh, a government witness, you know. Mm-hmm. But he was so damn paranoid, you know. I understood that. I remember that scene well. But Tony, at the end, he got a, he got really crazy, you know. And he did want to have me whacked, you know. 
Yeah, sometimes it comes down, down to them or you, doesn't it? Well, and whether there's anything going on, it's yeah, just that general. Yeah, you know, listen, let me tell you something, Gary. I had, I had 37 friends that I knew in my lifetime that were all killed by the Alpha, and I just didn't feel as though I wanted to be 38. Yeah, I don't you blame know? you. There's a difference. There's a difference between being an informant and a government witness or a state witness. I didn't go around with a wire, right? To try to get information. I just testified in what I was involved in. What they do? I guess they granted you immunity for everything. Did you? You got, you got a tra- transitional immunity. That means I don't know. That's supposed to be one of the best immunities you could get. And uh, what do I know about immunities? Even know. back then, really? immunity was immunity. I didn't know there was a difference between transitional. Yeah, and, I, uh, I did my testifying. And and I think uh, uh, everybody only gets you know like some specific Im- immunities. But I, I imagine that they give you the talk that you got to tell us everything, and don't lie about anything. And if we catch you lying about something, the whole deal's off. Exactly. You know, so everything they ask you is pertaining to crimes you committed, you know. Right. Uh, not not about, I mean, they'll want to know if you know any other crimes or something, you know. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, was Tony ever involved? Was, I told him that Tony was involved with me on the M&M killing. He was very instrumental in it. The M&M murder is very famous. Right. And that's one of the things that murder there that Tony done made rose Tony up through the ranks and made him a uh, first enforcer at that time because of that murder. So, but I knew he was going to beat it. Come on. It's a 22 year old case. The government knew it too. They just figured, let him spend money. Yeah. And what? after that, you know, you, and it's hard to find a guy guilty with only one guy testifying. You know? That's true without, you know, you got the, uh, the person that's made a deal who has everything to gain and uh, nothing to lose. Uh, and, and you know, it's like I could understand it during being somewhat suspect of, of your testimony in, in order to, and he has absolutely no corroborating evidence at all, no physical evidence, no other eyewitnesses, no, nobody. Not at all. Well, but you're a credible witness because mm-hmm. you're Frank Hulada. Like you, they they probably had been following you around and had ideas that you were doing things and you were involved with Tony Spilatro. They'd have, you know, like the the, the scene from Casino where the uh, the plane lands on the golf course. You know, they were really, you know. Yeah, that was that was funny. They were they were looking. And, that was really you funny. Know, they were definitely looking for you guys, and uh, so it it wasn't yeah, like you were twenty four hours a day, my friend. Yeah, those are those those surveillances are, are tough, especially <laughs> if you got that uh, after everybody goes home, somebody's still got to be out there, yeah. and they're not doing anything. That, that's some Gary, hard duty there. They even had a camera, Gary. Yeah. They even had a, FBI even had a camera in my restaurant in the roof that we located. <laughs> you found it, yeah. Actual surveillance camera, and I took it off out of the ceiling. They went nuts. The government. Oh, I can imagine <laughs> they their camera back. They had it right up. They had to write up a letter stating that they had a warrant to put it in there. You know, then I gave it back. <laughs> yeah. You didn't say. I don't know where it went. <laughs> oh, it's it's probably I said, better. I don't have it. Yeah. Of course, I didn't have it on me then. I just gave it to somebody to hold. Yeah. That's hilarious. The uh, uh, I would just tell people but know. I gave them their camera back when the uh, the the M M&M and M murders that people are, may know is James uh, Miraglia. And Billy McCarthy, is right. that correct? That became known as the Eminem exactly. Murders. Exactly, you're right. Done on behalf of Tony Spilatro. It seemed like they, they killed some dude that uh, they shouldn't have been killing and without any permission, if I remember right. I was just trying to verify it. They killed two two brothers, and their names were Scavo, Ronnie and Philly Scavo, and, and a girl, a waitress. They shouldn't have killed the two brothers all over a fist fight that happened prior to that and uh they killed him in a terrible location which was elmwood park which was highly populated with organized uh, the syndicate the outfit we you know they all lived there all the bosses in elmwood park it just drew a lot of heat on the town plus these two brothers that they killed uh they worked in this place that was called the black door and what's his name paul rico owned the building so what does that tell you? Yeah. <laughs> These guys signed their own birth death certificate. 
Yeah, they did. It's uh, uh, and, and that's the one that that in the opening scene of Casino where uh, uh, the Joe Pesci character has uh, the guy's head in the vice and and. Uh, I think he even, I think Tony actually even told you that story face to face, didn't he? Yeah. Actually, they had, they wouldn't do it in a movie because I told him, I said, that was in the vice. And when they did it that way, I said, no, the head was stuck in the vice with his face going down. And they turned the vice. You know, they had stick a nice fix in this guy's testicles and they Damn. constantly beat him, trying for him to tell them. They wanted to know who else was with him when he committed them killings. And finally, when his eyes popped out, he admitted it, and then they cut a stroke. Man, that was... Uh, uh, Tony Tony must have learned all that from uh, uh, Mad Sam DeStefano, I would say. We did a story on Mad Sam. <laughs> Boy, that guy was... <laughs> you know, when you're in a mob and you're one of the made members and you're afraid of somebody else like Mad Sam, really? that guy's a bad dude. <laughs> He's a bad dude. Listen, I knew him personally. The guy was a psycho. Yeah, that's, that's. And the funny thing about it, Sam really wasn't. Sam really wasn't an outfit guy. That's the funny thing about it. He just he had to kick in like everybody else, and they let him do anything he wanted because he used to give him over a million dollars a year in loan juice money. Money that he had all these loan sharks out, you know. So he basically got away with murder because of the money he was generating for them. And uh, Paul Rico was the one who actually uh, gave Sam the money to start him out. He met him in jail. That's what he meant. And then he gave him 150000 And then they put Tony on him with Sam to uh, watch him because they knew Sam was a nut. You know, this Sam killed his own brother. Yeah, he did. Yeah. They did, well, didn't he? He wasn't a very likable guy. And and then, according to what I read, his own brother, his other brother, and Tony killed him in the end. He'll read that in the book. Oh, good. You tell that story? Great. Tell us about the uh, uh, Lurch case with uh, Paul, our friend Paul Scharf. Tell us a little bit about that. Larry Newman. Larry Newman, yeah. That's Lurch. Yeah. I met Larry Newman in Stateville Penitentiary. He was doing 125 years for a triple murder. We both worked in the same... Uh, unit department together. We worked for uh, in a hospital ward for the criminally insane. <laughs> we worked for a that's you're killing that's me. A fact, too, I'm <laughs> telling you. So we worked together in this uh, psychiatric ward, and there was five other nurses too. And uh, that's when I met Larry. And uh, strange, strange guy. He was a Jewish lad. He had a uh, his, his IQ was 169. He was a very, very bright man, but he was a very, very dangerous individual. So when I wrote my first book, I put the story in there where Larry killed and uh, that kid from murder and uh, McHenry, one of his friends read it and said, we found out who killed your father. And, uh, and then I did testimony for that, and it was all screwed up because that little town over there in McHenry was controlled by the Alpha, so uh, they didn't want to give me too much credibility. Yeah, if I remember right, they actually they actually tried to destroy your credibility in order to damage you for testifying in other outfit trials. Is the way I read that. Exactly, that's what it was all about. You know, I sat in the room with these prosecutors and sheriffs from McHenry County, and not one of them had a pad of paper in their hand or a pencil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does that tell you? Yeah. You should know. They didn't care what you said because they just wanted to discredit you for the outfit so you would be discredited. So they could look back yeah. and say, look, he lied here. Look, he didn't get a conviction here and this other in this uh, uh, Larry Newman case. Uh, you know, he, he, he's not a credible witness. And, well, and I got him life in prison. I did get I did get Larry life in prison because he killed somebody in a robbery he should have never killed. You know, he he was a crazy bastard. Yeah, and, and there's and, a man who only did eleven and a half years on a hundred twenty-five year sentence. 
So figure that one out. Really? In, in Chicago, man, it's Chicago. It's Illinois. Everything's for everything. Back then, everything was for sale in the criminal justice system. I got a feeling. Money talks and bullshit walks. Yeah. And and folks, uh, that uh, that case we're talking about, if you want to go back and listen to the episodes of Murder in McHenry uh, with Paul Scharf, you'll you'll learn all the details about that story. His, his father, Paul Scharf's father, Ron Scharf, ran a bar, and he uh, he threw somebody out one night, and it was this Lurch's or Larry Newman's former wife or estranged wife or something, and yeah. and she got a hold of Lurch out in Las Vegas and and complained about Ron Scharf throwing him out of the bar, so he came back and killed him and killed a, an innocent bystander, a barnmaid was sitting there. So it, it's quite a story. Go back and listen to that murder in McHenry, and, and Paul's got a book out, too, about that if you're interested. But the fact is that Frank Culotta's book was what made them discover who the murderer was. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a heck of a story. Yes. And, and what's the name of, what was the name of your book again that, that had that story in it, Frank? My, that was my first book. It was just called Collada. Okay. All right, great. So, uh, Frank, remind the people again. Of, all of my books could be bought on Am. All the books could be bought on Amazon. What? what you have you got a list of them right there, uh, Handy? Could you read them off? Yeah, I don't. I do. You want to hear it, it? Yeah. Go ahead. My first book was called Collada. My second book was called Hole in the Wall Gang. And my final book was called, as I said, The Rise and Fall of a Casino Mobster. And that book has been out probably about three weeks, and it's number two in true crime right now. Great, great. You guys That's are pretty good. It was yeah. number one. It was? Oh, wow. You guys are doing good. Of course, you, you, you and Denny both have created a, a, a pretty decent, got a lot of name identification in, in this uh, mob uh uh, mob history uh, genre, shall we say, true crime, but but specifically mob history genre. You guys are getting a really, really well known names. And I'm that. done now. I ain't writing no more. I'm through. <laughs> it is a lot of work. I've written a couple of books, and it's I've never had the success like you have. But it it is a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of work. And I'm done. It's over. I don't want to do no more. I don't know no more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we're gonna we're gonna wind this up for this episode. We're gonna come back next week with uh, with the second episode, talking to uh, Frank Collada in Las Vegas, Nevada. Don't forget to, if you're out in Las Vegas, to look on TripAdvisor and and find Frank Collada's Mob Tour in Las Vegas. Um, I need to do my public service announcement. If you have a friend or relative or a loved one that has any problem has a problem with drugs or alcohol, make your first call to First Call. Call 816-361-5900 or go to their website, www.firstcallkc.org. What do you got to say to that, Aaron? I've got to say that folks need to get the documentary that started it all, Gangland Wire, available for rent or to own on Amazon as a streaming movie. Or do you have any of the DVDs left, Gary? Oh, yeah, I've always got a few DVDs. You uh, put a hit out on our donate button of $25 or more, and uh, Gary will autograph and mail one to you if you live in the United States. But don't stop there, because what you need to do is get the Kansas City Mob Tour app. For $1.99, you can take your iPhone and travel all around Kansas City to notorious mob locations, historic as they are. Then you can listen to Gangland Wire through that app, and uh, match that up, like Union Station, when we talk about the Union Station massacre, or, or maybe drive down and see where the Virginia Tavern used to be, and see where the guys got shot there. And, of course, what you want to do is get the latest and greatest from Gary Jenkins, his newest book, Leaving Vegas. How FBI wiretaps ended mob domination of Las Vegas casinos. Not only is it in hardback. Or no, it's not in hardback. It's just a paperback. Paperback and then the Kindle. The Kindle version is the one to get because I linked the actual audio to the each time I talk about the uh, audio or the transcripts that the Lefty and Nick Savella and Tony Reip and, and Tuffy DeLuna and guys like that talking about talking to Carl Thomas at the Tropicana and Joe Agosto. Why well, you can link right to the actual audio. And listen to the words from the mouth of the men that did it. 
which is what we stand for here. All right, Frank, uh, it's been good talking to you, and we will see you next week. Good night, Aaron. Good night. Thank you. Music provided by Odd Omatic. Follow them on Twitter at Odd Omatic Music.